Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Grand Rounds. Dr. Thomas is out at a conference, so I have the pleasure of doing the intro and leading the Q&A section today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joshua Safer. Dr. Safer is the Executive Director of the Mount Sinai Center of, for Transgender Medicine and Surgery in New York City and Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Safer is a co-author of the Endocrine Society Guidelines for the Medical Care of Transgender Patients, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care, version 8, the Gender Affirming Hormone Treatment Sections for Up to Date, the Most Current Transgender Medical Care Review in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the Most Current Review of Transgender Medical Care in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Dr. Safer was the inaugural president of the United States Professional Association for Transgender Health and is currently a World Professional Association for Transgender Health board member. He also serves on the Global Education Institute for the World Professional Association for Transgender Health and has been a scientific co-chair for multiple World Professional Association for Transgender Health international meetings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joshua Safer. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me for Grand Rounds this morning. And uh, uh, let me just um, jump right into things. So, um, so my, my, my talk today you see is called Current Evidence Based in Transgender Medicine. And what I want to do with the next uh, 55 minutes or so is, uh, is, is walk through uh, how, the, uh, how the framing of, of, of gender identity and being trans and how and, and gender affirming care has shifted from a medical perspective, how we got here over the past, let's say 10, 20 years, and the kinds of things that we're doing with regard to um, medical care and what some of the logic is. And, and you, have, you can see I have a subhead, care strategy and knowledge gaps, and there are all sorts of, of knowledge gaps and there are opportunities for research. And I'm gonna layer that in because I think that's gonna be an important um, aspect of, of of this whole thing, what do we need to know, and what what are some of the um, what are some research thoughts for the future? And 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 um and the, the flip side of that too is what are the things where we we kind of do think we already know the know that maybe we could confirm or otherwise, but they're not necessarily the the the, the main research interest. Uh, I have no financial relationships to disclose, um, so. The talk outline is divided into two and then a little smidgen at the end. So it's the um, basis for current strategies um, for, for gender affirming medical interventions, like I said, and then actually going through what we do medically, which is heavily, an, um, which is heavily a hormonal thing uh, and, uh, and what some of the logic pattern there is. And I will touch briefly on some of the surgeries because I think we as medicine folk need to know what our surgical colleagues are doing because we really, are, I think we all recognize this, but I need to say it out loud for gender affirming care. We are the people who are experts for our patients in terms of um, what the um, surgical logic might be, who the good surgeons might be. You can't go online and find reviews. We all know for cardiology or for myself and endocrine for the thyroid doc or the pituitary doc. And, and the same is true for our surgeons. So um, starting off, these, the, the, these talks usually start off with terminology, and I need to start off with terminology myself because often people say, oh, let me define things, and they define things in various ways that suit what they're trying to say, but not how we all generally speak. So um, let me try to unmuddy some of those muddy waters. So gender and sex, I'm enough of an English um, a student from the past to know that sex refers to that biology that, um, that we associate, that, that's associated with reproduction. And gender is the construct for various things that get these kind of um, sex labeling. They're, they're both very broad terms. And I think for us as medical people and, and scientists, um, the terms are kind of sloppy 
and broad, and we need to be more specific when we use them. And, and you'll hear part of the problem right away with the very next term here, which is gender identity. Uh, so gender identity has is, is actually two concepts at this point out there. Um, and um, despite the words gender, a, con a construct, an identity, something that maybe you even could choose yourself, we medical people are not using that word to mean that. Our social science colleagues actually are. But, um, but, but, but us medicine folks are using this term to reference that biology in your brain that tells you what sex you are. And I'm gonna walk through some of, um, some of the data underlying the concept in just a moment, but the bottom line of it is that for sexual reproduction, it's not sufficient to have gametes to share. It's not sufficient even to have the organs to share those gametes. You need to actually know your role. You need to know your choice of partners, or at least, it's easier to conceptualize for animal species uh, that that would be true. We humans are able to be educated. And so it's a, a broader and more complicated reality. But it's that underlying biology that we're talking about, we medical folks anyway. And maybe we even need a new word, brain sex. I don't know. But or maybe we should keep the word gender identity and the social scientists get to go find another word like gender expression. Um, but just recognize there are those two very separate concepts there. And then um, the last um, term I want to talk about um, before jumping into um, data is gender dysphoria. Um, uh, ICD-10, well, for, for, for um, uh, half a century, we've been um, thinking of being trans as a mental health concern and looking at it through a mental health lens. And ICD-10 um, labels being trans as gender dysphoria with, a, with, with mental health um, definitions. Uh, so the problem though, is that if you have an incongruence between your brain sex, that is your gender identity and the rest of your biology, that doesn't, isn't necessarily a mental health concern. And so the, um, but we're still stuck with that term. We know this, WHO has been discussing this, debating this for years. ICD-11 is gonna have a term called gender incongruence in the sexual health chapter. Whether there's mental health implications or not is, will, will be a separate code and a, and, a, and a separate consideration. But here we are with this um, word. And so we end up with funny language, like parent patients saying, oh, I have chest dysphoria as an uh, explanation for why they would need a chest surgery. And then I have a young, happy person there who's clearly not dysphoric the way my um, psychiatry colleagues would define that. Um, and yet it's a, a transgender person um, uh, appropriately looking for a medically inter indicated intervention, but, but, uh, but, but clearly not uh, with a mental health concern. All right, so let me, let me go to some of our understanding of gender identity in humans and how we got to be where we are over the past, like I said, 10 to 20 years. Um, for a good half century, the viewpoint was that, this, that your gender identity, your knowledge of what sex you are was from your environment, maybe your parents told you and you've been going that way, or a societal construct and there's variability to how you could even define this, or it's a passive response to your anatomy. You looked at your genitals and you said, oh, at whatever age it is that you could conceptualize that and that, oh, that's what I am. And you hung out with the people with the matching genitals. Um, and um, there is, you know, this, this shift to this uh, understanding that that um, must not be true, not, uh, and it must be more complex and more ingrained. And I kind of divide those data, and I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly because I think some of you have heard me talk, even know some of my, 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 my basic data, but happy to expand as needed. I kind of divide the data into four buckets based on how, I, how strong I think the data really are. So the first bucket is historical attempts to manipulate gender identity among among intersex people. And the, my favorite paper is from um, about, oh, it's almost 20 years ago now, um, New England Journal. It's a group at Johns Hopkins which were, where, where they were treating something called cloacal extrophy, maldevelopment of the GU and GI tract, requiring boatloads of surgery and um, recognizing then as it, what is still true now, and I'll touch at this way at the tail end when I talk about surgeries, um, that um, vaginoplasty, construction of female or typically female genitalia is just better established from a surgical perspective um, versus construction of, 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 of male genitalia or typically male genitalia anyway, um, uh, uh, that is uh, phalloplasty. And so um, if gender identity was based on what your parents said or what looking at your genitals or some other passive and thing, thing that could be manipulated, then the easiest thing to do in any circumstance where there was um, significant 
significant surgery in that area required is to create a vagina and raise that person as a girl. And so what happened in this particular circumstance is they, there were a total of 16 people ever in this Johns Hopkins group, which was a destination surgical group for this particular surgery, um, who had XY chromosomes. And if we just think for half a moment to the, um, we, 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 we are currently estimating a half a percent or a percent of people out there are, are transgender, which just means that 99% more or less, of people are cisgender, that is not transgender, and um, actually, and, and therefore, if you have 16 people with XY chromosomes and you want to bet, then you're going to bet that maybe one is transgender or maybe none are transgender. And, um, and so to simply say that you're going to raise them all as girls, uh, well, let's, let, um, you know, let's just go to see what happened. Um, what happened is at around junior high, despite these kids being told they were girls, given a vagina when they were kids, when they, when they were babies, so they wouldn't know they had the surgery. Part of the framework, by the way, and some of us are old enough to remember doing this. I, I went to medical school being taught that this is the, the um, appropriate course of action, not to reveal the medical history to the patient till they're age 18 so that we don't confuse things, um, give them the appropriate hormones at the appropriate times in puberty so that they otherwise develop um, how um, they would stereotypically according to the sex uh, that we've determined they should have. Well, anyway, with this program, four of these kids came and told the surgeons that they were boys with vaginas, being told they were girls by their parents, um, et cetera. And they started interviewing the kids. And by the time they wrote their New England Journal paper, all of the kids who knew their medical history were saying they were boys, um, leaving them only with five kids who still didn't know their medical history, who were living as girls, and one kid who refused to talk to them uh, having because they had lied to this person, which of course they had. Um, so just moving along, there are, other, there are case series there, but that has kind of changed the framework for how we approach intersex surgeries. And I don't, so we'll never be able to get a data set like that again. Next bucket is twin studies. And for this, I just have my, my, my favorite paper here is really a very simple paper. It's a survey of the case reports to date. Uh, this was written uh, about, uh, about 10 years ago. So the case reports as of about 10 years ago of trans people who had a twin, who were twins. And so in the case when the trans person's twin was a fraternal twin, then in all the case reports as of then, um, none of the twins were trans. Now, it's not 100% true. I can tell you I actually have patients who are fraternal twins where they are both trans, uh, but, 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 but it's um, not likely, just like it's not super likely among other sibling pairs. By contrast, um, in those instances, and it's a couple of dozen in each group as of when they wrote this paper, um, every time the trans person had an identical twin, the identical um, uh, um, well, not every time, but 40% of the time, the twin was, is also trans. And um, that degree of concordance, just to refresh your memories, is, um, is pretty strong. Um, so something like type 1 diabetes has a 50% concordance rate. And so 40% concordance rate is pretty impressive. And this is not a controlled study or anything, but we have a bunch of twins who are raised by the same parents in the same environment ostensibly. But when they have really close DNA, the chance that they're also um, trans is, is, is dramatically increased. So then my next my next category here is actually currently my favorite category because up until now I'm just giving associations, um, but the next um, category of data gets a little bit at some at things that we could potentially explore for mechanism, and uh, that's where I sit as a scientist. Like, what's the future here? So and and that that category is um, in utero um, Anderson exposure data, and kind of the two extremes there are um, on the one hand. Um, Con, um, virilizing congenital adrenal hyperplasia, where individuals with XX chromosomes um, are exposed with various um, adrenal enzyme um, uh, 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 mutations to more androgen uh, with varying degrees of virilization. And what we see is that um, depending upon what survey you believe, because the research is all pretty low level, so kind of simple surveys in this case, um, 5% of people maybe um, in that circumstance have male gender identity, XX chromosome individuals with male gender identity. 
important to, uh, because there's some anxiety among people who have virulent congenital adrenal hyperplasia or, 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 or parents of same. 95% um, of these XX chromosome individuals have female gender identity, according to those surveys. But 5% with male gender identity is a huge number. That's that if we just look at XX chromosome people um, in generally in the population, certainly 5% do not have male gender identity. And on the flip side of things, even more striking to me is complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, uh, where so the androgen receptor does not work and the external genitalia are really just uh, hormone uh, um, influenced. And so these people, XY chromosome, are born with um, what look to be very um, conventional, um, um, uh, uh, what we would think of as typically female uh, genitalia, uh, 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 vagina, uh, um, clitoris, urethra has not migrated, and um, the, they're, they're to, raised as girls. And then when they hit puberty, the, um, and their estrogen levels go toward adult levels, they, the testosterone that they do also have, because they do have testes, uh, just uh, intra-abdominal, um, uh, can't act on the antigen receptor and therefore they develop breasts. I think many of us think, of, um, think in terms of breast growth as, as uh, being estrogen dependent and it is, but it's also dependent on not having estrogen blocking it. An alternative way I, I think of breast growth is that testosterone um, prevents you from, from, from breast growth. That's what we see with what we think of as a typical male puberty, for example. And if you don't have testosterone, then you get breasts or later in, uh, with, with, with aging with some uh, cisgender men, with non-transgender men who, where their um, testosterone levels go down, they get gynecomastia, for, ex for example, just with uh, the estrogens they have circulating, but the absence of testosterone blocking that. Anyway, Congenital adrenal hyperplasia people get they get their they get that breast development. But the reason I'm even telling this whole dang story in the middle of this at, at this point in the talk is that um, overwhelmingly um, uh, individuals with complete androgen sensitivity syndrome have female gender identity. So XY individuals with female gender identity, and it just suggests that uh, at least for these people but maybe for all of us, maybe it's more universal, you need some androgen action on your brain in order to be able to have a male gender identity. And if you don't, then, 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 then you won't, at least mostly there are some case reports uh, um, that, are, that are otherwise, but uh, maybe it's not even complete androgen sensitivity syndrome. Bottom line of, um, so, so now let me just model that a little bit because now I'm actually talking about something that's quasi-mechanistic here and where we, there's potential to think about um, things to explore. So if I'm thinking of the various factors, whether those are genes or epigenetic phenomena or, 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 or what have you to, um, that are associated with gender identity and the, and the various circumstances that could be happening in utero um, influencing this, including an altered testosterone level or yet other factors that I have that, that not defined, um, then I have these kinds of possibilities for, for, for genes we could be investigating. Um, you could have independent gender identity spectrum genes or factors not influenced by anything. You could have things that um, um, factors or genes where um, they're influenced by the testosterone level and they get turned on um, or not turned on or, or, or whatever that is. Um, equivalently from other these other unknown factors, just kind of putting it out there. And, and then finally, perhaps combination um, uh, genes or factors where they uh, might be affected by both testosterone and those um, undefined other circumstances. And, and important to think about here because people make the mistake of thinking, oh, are we gonna identify a gene for being transgender? And I don't think so with this kind of modeling. I think what we're talking about is modeling for gender identity, how you know what sex you are, um, or you know maybe that could be, there's a certain breadth to that, especially in a more complex organism like humans. Um, and then if we're like, let's say looking for male gender identity, we would be looking among all people with male gender identity, cis or trans, or for female gender ana um, analogously, uh, and, 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 and trying to look at those entire populations based on gender identity, not based on whether you're cis or trans. Now my final my final bucket here, I kind of revert back to the associations here, are attempts to find brain anatomy associations with gender identity. Um, they're the prettiest pictures, but the weakest data. And um, the, the, the prettiest picture still is from the 90s, um, which is uh, um, histology slides actually, um, where what they did is they um, 
we're um, taking um, slices from cadaver brains and staining them in a region of the, new, uh, of the hypothalamus that was associated, the investigators thought, with, um, with uh, homosexual behavior in mice and rats. Um, that's its own little side story, like, um, because in retrospect, if you look at those data, it's not clear that that was um, homosexual behavior those, it was because they didn't know if those mice and rats were, uh, uh, were, were gay or, or trans, but nobody knew how to talk to the rats. And so we, that couldn't be established. But, the, um, um, but anyway, back to the humans. So um, they were looking at this point for a, the, the gay gene, very stereotypical, um, narrow thinking here. Um, but the good news is that their data were reliably collected and so we can look at their pictures. And um, so they were thinking of, um, um, so this is a, a stain from a person who is ostensibly a straight man and you have this very intense staining pattern and by um, and, and this contrast with this staining pattern of a an XX female, not stated whether she's gay or straight because I don't think that was relevant to their thought process they were very focused on the guys, um, and um, and then they were going to look for whether you know the uh, whether homosexuality could be identified this way. And so this is the, a slice of a brain of a of a person who is ostensibly a gay man. And as you can see, the staining pattern is identical to that of the straight man, and they have negative data. And we would have never seen this, but they made the mistake back in the 1990s of thinking that transgender women were um, some variation of gay men. Uh, they kind of conflated that, and uh, and so they did find um, a slice of brain from somebody who was reported to be a transgender woman, and lo and behold, the staining pattern here matches that of the ostensibly cisgender woman. So they went back and got a whole bunch of controls, and they controlled for people who got hormones, didn't get hormones. Mostly, that's what they they they, they that that's their 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 biggest control. Um, among the transgender people and among cisgender people, all sorts of, 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 of brain specimens. And this held up and was pretty consistent. And they got themselves a paper in Nature, actually, and these pretty pictures that I get to share with you. Um, trying to follow up with this with PET scan and MRI has not been particularly successful. It, it, it gets muddied by hormone influence very quickly. Um, and that's kind of where things sit right now. And some of it, I think, is just that this, the modalities used are actually less granular than um, than old fashioned um, 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 staining studies, you know, from 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 decades prior. Um, but so maybe more to um, may, maybe more sophistication necessary here. All right, if this is biology, what do we need to know? And so I want to go into what what it is that we're really doing now. And with that same lens, which is um, what do we know? What do we not know? What are the data, et cetera? So um, first of all, um, we People, we only know if people are trans if they tell us they're trans. There is no scan as evidence by what I just showed you, and there's no lab test. Um, and even if there were things that, uh, if there were clusters or gene arrays from, let's say, that, that those gender identity things that I was showing before, that still um, is hard to envision being useful uh, as uh, clinically or diagnostically for a given individual. Um, and so we're waiting for people to identify themselves. And therefore really most of, it's true, we see these trans kids who um, tell us their gender identity at very early ages, but more often um, a presentation is adult or, or, or late adolescence. And uh, that's, and is it, you know, again, think about it. I was beginning to say it already just now, um, the people need to be able to say that they are, they need to know what gender identity is, and then they need to be able to articulate it in a way that convinces we medical folks um, that they, so that we believe them and actually uh, treat them. And so is that articulation or awareness? And then there's a whole other layer of conformity too. Remember that transgender people, uh, you know, or kids in general are trying to be like their peers. And, and, and this is a, it's a mixture of conformity and awareness, I guess I would say. I just saw a transgender 20 something um, uh, a, a couple of months ago, uh, a transgender woman, um, young transgender woman, um, she walk, just beginning um, a medical intervention saying to me, well, it had been living a boy, as a boy all through high school saying, well, it never even dawned on me that all the other boys weren't thinking they were girls just like me. And, uh, you, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a mixed piece there. And then the second element that ends up being relevant when we think about our, um, um, uh, when we think about our, our treatment strategies is that fertility is, uh, which is addressed in an ad hoc 
fashion is compromised by our interventions, um, by, by our hormones, and then uh, to, to obviously a much greater degree by the surgeries. And how we mitigate that is going to be significant. And you'll see some of that in just a moment. So going to strategy, um, this is um, a picture of a pair of identical twins. Um, who uh, from uh, Maine near in the Boston Globe from you can see about a little over 10 years ago. Um, and they're just shy of their 15th birthday when the picture was taken. They're both XY chromosome and the one on your left is the one who is trans. Uh, and all that's happened is when this picture was taken is the, um, is the transgender girl has received puberty blockers, GnRH agonists, which kind of accentuate the point that what we think of as a typical female puberty has kind of this linear element with it, with kind of more of just an a, um, um, an a aging um, and, a, and, a, and, a and, and a kind of a shallower slope where what we think of as a typical male puberty, there is this inflection point where there's this real bolus of testosterone. And that's actually where I wanna draw your attention because that's what ends up being super relevant to our trans uh, patients who are only presenting, like you heard me say, in later adolescence or early adulthood. Um, and so here, this, this kid is XY, he's cisgender, he's not transgender, and look at the impact of testosterone. And I love the picture because remember, they're identical twins, which means two years prior to this picture being taken, the next door neighbor was mixing them up and couldn't remember which one was which. And now look at them, not hard to tell. And, and now look at all the action of testosterone that causes them to differ. So the hair above the lip you were expecting, but look at the squaring of the mandible, look at the soft tissue in the neck, the, look at that larynx. You can be certain his voice has, has dropped. Look at the um, SEM muscles on the side of his neck. He's, this is a known kid. We know he's a bookworm at the time that this picture was taken and not somebody going to the gym at the age of 14 and lifting weights with his head or anything like that. Um, this, is a this is testosterone action alone. So, so very dramatic and significant for our patients um, if they're only up coming to a subsequent to some of this development. And then the other way I like to think about this is that um, is, um, is discriminating between what we think of as typically male and typically female from a hormone perspective really just relates to testosterone. That is um, estrogen levels to the degree that estradiol, because that's really all we're measuring, um, uh, um, is, a, is a reasonable surrogate. Estrogen levels are very overlapping. And, um, but testosterone, again, to the degree that test, total testosterone is a legitimate surrogate because that's all we're measuring there. Um, uh, testosterone, total testosterone is very dramatically different, tenfold different for total testosterone levels actually between what we think of as male and female. And so from a treatment perspective, there's lots of thinking that there's this yin yang estrogen versus testosterone, estradiol versus testosterone. But really what we're doing is we're taking testosterone up and down while we're maintaining estradiol in the, uh, just a, a global adult range. And so just getting into strategies then a bit. Um, for younger kids, for, pre, uh, for prepubescent kids, there's nothing. There's no hormonal difference between them, and we, um, and we don't do any medical interventions. And um, we do something called social transition, which is being respectful of the kid and let them um, wear the clothes they want, dress how they want, refer to themselves how they want. Um, there's fear among some parents that the kids will, be, uh, will brainwash themselves into thinking they're trans when they're not. But I think when we hark back to the um, to our, our our data for gender identity and our failure to convince intersex kids to switch their gender identity with surgery when they were babies and lying to them throughout their childhood uh, and not telling them anything till they um, till till, uh, till till they turn eighteen in terms of their medical history, if we failed to uh, brainwash kids with that really intense program. Um, I don't know that I'm super concerned that a different haircut or a different set of clothes and a bunch of kids on the playground are gonna have at least a long-term impact. Uh, and so I think this is a relatively safe thing to do to just simply let the kid do what the kid wants. And if the kid is trans uh, or, 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 um, uh, or um, what, every, anywhere in a, in a gender diverse space, uh, then you'll only have been respectful as a parent. Now, it's true as kids, kids actually get to puberty, to physical puberty before we trust them to be making social decisions. And the, so that ends up coming, that, that brings us to the next line of intervention and the logic pattern for it. And it's, um, so we have kids entering puberty where we still are not convinced that they are articulating their gender identity to us 
at least in a way that we understand to be correct. Or even if we are, are, are clear there, we're not clear they understand treatment implications and such. And so we're not rushing to treat them yet. And what we have available to us is the, 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 our, our approach to precocious puberty, which is a variation on theme that is um, um, kids entering puberty earlier than we think they are socially ready to enter puberty, where we give them GnRH agonists for a year or two. And we talk about giving them agonists at 10 or 2, but um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. It's The point is no earlier than 10 or 2 because it, it, 10 or 1 is prepubescent and they won't have any make any difference. Um, a, a concern, and I'll talk about this a, a little bit too, is that in precocious puberty, we typically um, pause puberty for a year or two and then move on to um, then stop that, the treatment and let the, their endogenous hormones act um, and puberty to take place. Um, and so, um, and with the fear being that we don't, we want to avoid hypogonadism for extended periods of time with harm to, to bone and risk of osteoporosis later. From the precocious puberty literature, uh, we feel really relatively comfortable with this year or two of treatment because uh, we have people who've had this done um, decades prior for precocious puberty. And it's very difficult for us to find any healthcare concern in those adults who had these treatments in the past, including um, it's very difficult to, ask or to, to determine that they have any increased osteoporosis risk. Um, that said though, um, that's our safety window is that year or two. And so we don't wanna leave kids on GnRH agonists for extended periods of time. We are using that to sit and be deliberate and be thoughtful with parents and figure out what next steps are gonna be. Is it gonna be endogenous hormones or is it gonna be exogenous hormones to match, um, uh, uh, to match gender identity? And both are gonna have implications. Um, we had previously in our guidelines reserved hormone therapy for let's say age 16 and up with the thought that that would match um, decision making, um, but I think there's um, uh, openness to um, trying to get a little closer to biological puberty. Uh, you can't really get maybe back down to 12 or 10, but maybe uh, maybe age 14 or so, depending upon the relative maturity of the kid and, and how clearly they're articulating things. So I want to talk about the puberty blockers just for a moment because they are the conversation out there in the news right now. And part of the problem is conflating multiple circumstances um, as if it's all just one thing, lumping them all together. So to, I realize it's an adult audience. So I had to kind of pull out here. Puberty begins at two. It's a crazy nomenclature. I don't think we adult medicine folks are any better in some of the things we do. Um, and uh, then, um, and then the important point, and, and, and I'll get to this a little more right now, is this is a floor, not a ceiling. There's no point to treating earlier. Our data are not two versus three. Our data are two versus some prepubescent period. And I want to talk about the different buckets here that get conflated. So most people, as, you know, in the lay world, and I think us medical folks are maybe guilty, some of us, are thinking about using puberty blockers for some kid who's not going to want treatment downstream for whatever reason. They're not trans, they're trans, but they don't want treatment, whatever it is. And, um, and the point is they're going to change their mind, go off the puberty blockers, and endogenous puberty will take place. In that circumstance, and, and the fear, and the point is we really don't want to hurt that kid our, our tolerance for risk is really low because the alternative is no treatment at all. And uh, so the, um, but the, the, that is actually the circumstance where I feel most secure as an endocrinologist because that's exactly the precocious puberty circumstance where we have pretty good evidence that decades later, uh, we, nothing, we, we've not done anything bad. The, um, and, and we're not going to get better data than the precocious puberty, precocious puberty data that exists because the reality is we don't really have too many kids in that circumstance. As most of the kids who come to us and say they're gender diverse or they think they're trans or whatever and get on treatment um, really are on treatment and go on to subsequent interventions. And they don't just stop their stop their, their, their puberty blockers. But the handful who do, if we, um, I, I think I feel safe for them. Um, the next bucket, I would say, are what I'm, what are, are trans masculine individuals, transgender boys, that is, so, um, so female to male. And in this circumstance, um, we just looked at, here at Mount Sinai at our pediatric group from 2022, and um, virtually all of the transgender boys in this circumstance came for puberty blockers in Tanner four or five, late puberty, pretty much done with their puberty. And uh, 
is not shocking because an early time for kids to present is maybe age 12. And what we think of as a typical female puberty it, um, can often be occurring before that. But anyway, there it is. And so I'm, if I'm thinking about when to start puberty blockers for those kids, um, what I'm observing is virtually every one of them showed up, that means with breast development. And I know from others um, from, from other surveys that virtually every trans masculine person who gets on hormones is going to go on to have a chest masculinization surgery if they are able to. And so um, essentially, by starting puberty blockers later, I've pretty much guaranteed they're all going to, or 90 odd percent of them are going to have chest surgeries. And if I could identify these kids a little bit earlier, I would... Um, I, I, and save a few of them from some chest surgeries, that's some real potential benefit that we're missing. So this is a group where we're not being overly aggressive or overly liberal. We're being, um, um, we're, 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 we're being too conservative and not aggressive enough in getting puberty blockers aboard and identifying them and moving them over to, 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 to endocrine. And from a fertility perspective, because we can stimulate ovaries, we have data for that too. We published even um, a live birth um, uh, last year um, uh, here at Sinai from a transgender guy on his testosterone. Um, uh, with eggs that we extracted from his ovaries and implanted in the cisgender female partner. Um, so because we can stimulate um, um, uh, um, eggs and, um, for retrieval from ovaries if they're still in the body, even on kids who start with their with, with puberty blockers and, 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 and get on, on, on testosterone, um, I, I'm reasonably comfortable in the, um, on, in, 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 on the fertility side of things. By contrast, um, my last group here are the trans feminine folks. So that's the transgender girls, male to female. And um, in that circumstance, um, um, really from a fertility protection perspective, I, my, my, my biggest and best option is sperm banking. So they need to have spermatogenesis to sperm bank. And it, um, here I have kids who might be going through puberty a little after their presentation. So they might really show up if they're showing up at age 12 at 10 or two, and they could really get on puberty blockers then. But spermatogenesis is something that you're gonna see more around 10 or three or so. So one of the things we're actually looking at here at Sinai is how um, virilized are you if we let you go to three or four so that you can sperm bank um, before we begin your puberty blockers. And so that's a group where for that reason, for um, maybe we want to be deferring puberty blockers just a little bit so we can allow that door to remain open for them. And there's even an additional piece relating to sexual function there. Um, same um, variation and theme, happy to talk about that in a little more detail. But the point is these are three very different groups and we really need to be medically thinking of them as distinct. All right, for moving on to adulthood, for transgender men, we're adding testosterone. And for today's talk, I don't have much to say. It's like a single slide and I'm gonna be agnostic in terms of the approaches. We use injections and we use gels and it just becomes a testosterone talk at that point because the, uh, um, the, we're, we're, uh, it's uh, same as, as for cisgender men. The main concern um, with uh, androgens is that they stimulate erythropoiesis. And so we can unmask erythrocytoses uh, which might need to be addressed where we might've missed them in somebody with a typically female hormone profile. For transgender women, like you heard me say already, it's not giving estrogen per se, it's blocking testosterone. But our best tool for blocking testosterone actually is estradiol. We, um, it, it's actually a, a marvelous agent because it uh, feeds back centrally, causes those testosterone levels to go down. And my the biggest bugaboo, same as I was already talking about with the kids, is, is hypogonadism and bone harm. But I'm actually using estradiol as my tool to suppress testosterone. And I can, um, and, and, and so I'm protecting bone with that. And this would be the only agent, but for the fact that we have some data that the, um, that exogenous estrogens are associated with increased risk of thromboses. So we've invented these cocktails where we add adjunct agents in order to give lower doses of estradiol to our transgender people. And so um, the classic one we've used forever, 
historically because it was cheap, but we're still using it because it's safe, is a spironolactone, which um, was you know, meant to block the mineralocorticoid receptor, we all know, but in pharmacological levels, it acts on the androgen receptor to a huge degree as well. And so it allows us to give lower doses of estrogen. Those of us who treat trans people know that there is this additional impact of metabolites, I guess, of spironolactone that interfere with, um, with synthesis of testosterone even. We watch testosterone levels go down um, with these, um, with, um, in, uh, in people receiving spironolactone. It's not just blocking the androgen receptor. And then there are some other antiandrogens. The GnRH agonists themselves, of course, are attractive. A progestational agent called cyproterone acetate was popular in Europe, um, but it's losing favor because some of the things that we attributed to estrogens or thought would be attributable to estrogens, um, like elevated prolactin, um, seem to associate actually with cyproterone acetate in transgender people. They're things they see in Europe, but we actually don't see in the United States where spironolactone is our, is our preferred adjunct agent. So basically estrogens feeding back negatively is our, is, is our primary approach to therapy. And I wanna talk a little bit about the thrombosis piece uh, because there's a lot, much anxiety, but, um, but also much to reassure us. So this is not, you don't need to look at the details of this is a meta-analysis from 2019, looking at exogenous estrogens given for all sorts of reasons. So mostly cisgender women. And the main point, the purple lines going to the right are increased thrombotic events. And the main point is that um, the more estrogen you give, the more th th thrombotic events you see across all products. There are two other points. One is that when you add a progestational agent um, in all the circumstances where we do this and can see it, the thrombosis risk goes up yet higher. And so, you know, again, another ding on progestins actually. And then the other thing is that um, uh, transdermal estrogen products uh, are associated with fewer thrombotic events, at least cross-sectionally. And um, people have taken this to mean that perhaps there is what's uh, um, something called the first pass through the liver effect, where because there are uh, thromb uh, there are uh, clotting factors in the liver when you take estrogens orally, that will be more of a um, that will be more thrombogenic than um, than than um, than transdermal products. I will just caution you that if you look at those data, they don't actually measure estrogens. And we know that transdermal products from using, let's say, testosterone or, or, or corticosteroids are um, very inefficient at getting these large molecules across the skin. And so it is possible that we're just delivering lower doses on average. And this is all part of the dose response connection. And actually the whole first pass of liver effect um, is maybe thrown into doubt. That's for cisgender people too, just putting it out there. Anyway, absolute numbers um, of, 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 of DVT events. So this is like a study of about 700 transgender women on, on oral estradiol for two years had one thrombotic event, so hard to do statistics. And um, um, something that has come up among people, um, uh, among people taking care of transgender people is telling transgender women to hold their estrogens in the perioperative period because those are both um, uh, times when um, th there is risk for VTE. Well, here at Sinai, um, we looked um, at when we did this, because we were doing following that model um, for a eighth time period anyway. And we had about just shy of 500 surgeries and um, one recorded event, recognizing that we have a very aggressive uh, DVT pro prophylaxis protocol in, the, um, in, in, in surgery. So early ambulation and, and you know, the, the stockings and, 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 and rush to anticoagulate um, very quickly when people are at risk. Um, but the important point is this, there was much pressure asking, really, what's the benefit even of holding these estrogens? And it's, the patients are, are obviously suffer from having their hormone levels swing back and forth in the perioperative period. And so we looked at a similar time period where we didn't, where we basically told the patients to take their hormones right on through. And um, we have about 600 surgeries done over that time period. And over that time period, we had no recorded events. Again, a very aggressive DVT protocol here at Sinai. Um, but in that setting, at least, uh, there doesn't seem to be evidence that holding estrogens has any relevance in terms of VTE risk in the perioperative period. Um, so just going through some of the agents that we're using, spironolactone, I, you, I, I talked about it already, acts on the androgen receptors. Um, very clear mechanism there. It's effective, uh, excuse me. Um, so 
um, spironolactone acting on androgen receptors, and I talked about it already a little bit in terms of decreasing testosterone. DNRH agonists, we know that in a bolus form, they um, block the entire axis, and then you can add back the hormones you want. We do that with fertility. Um, we use them um, when we really want to knock down hormones, like for prostate cancer. And so they could be a logical adjunct for trans people as well. Um, the um, In terms of um, using them um, for extended periods of time, that's my safety question. Um, a little bit of a question, but in the UK, they've been using this as their adjunct for a while now without any obvious harms. Um, there's a, um, a little bit of a cost um, concern, um, but in the great scheme of the healthcare dollar, nothing we do in, in, in terms of gender affirming care is very expensive, including frankly, our surgeries, uh, let's say compared to like um, uh, oncology or, 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 um, or heart care or orthopedics. Um, so progestins. So for those of you who are taking care of transgender people, you'll know that there's a lot of pressure out there to buy patients to use progestins because there is um, some inter internet conversation um, about breast development. And I just wanna review for those of us medicine folks that the historical reason we use progestins is part of the cocktail for cisgender women is there is a uterus present and unopposed estrogens have a cancer risk. And so we need to have this, um, this, this, uh, this uh, progestational um, element and and um, maybe even a, 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 a cyclical element for, for, for younger folks. Um, uh, they're, they're potent in lowering the testosterone, so they create kind of a pretty picture. However, um, depending upon the progest, the progestins are highly variable in terms of the receptors they touch. And so for some progestins, there's even a degree of virilization associated. So the numbers are pretty, but the actual, uh, um, but the actual anti-virilization, which is being, um, which is being um, sought, is not actually achieved. Um, and then I said already from that, um, um, and, and, and showed you with, uh, with, uh, with the British me uh, Medical Journal paper, um, that there's greater VTE risk. And this is across the progestins that have been studied, whether it's for oral birth control or, um, or, or, or other circumstances when added to estrogens. So again, I got kind of a harm here rather than, rather than a benefit. Um, and then when I'm looking at the, um, the Women's Health Initiative data, um, when we look at um, um, the, the striking thing there, huge study, so many people in it that they actually have um, 10,000 um, women who, um, who were, had hysterectomies and were getting estrogen alone in a placebo controlled way. And the notable point here is that those women did the best. So we did we did a lot of worrying about the women on the on, on the um, on the combination um, estrogen progestin um, um, regimens where they did not have the heart benefit we were predicting, which is why we stopped pushing um, uh, um, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, but the and and we worried about heart um, increased heart disease even in some or or, or increased breast cancer in some, um, but. Notably, those that did not have the progestational agent had, um, had less breast cancer, less heart disease. So I'm saying the progestins are associated with more of those things that we associate with estrogens, but perhaps erroneously. And um, um, I referenced the European experience in transgender um, women with increased prolactins, and they even think they're seeing a small association with meningiomas, but that's so infrequent. I'm not sure how convinced I am of that. It's certainly not something to see here in the United States. But again, another ding on progestins. All right, uh, let me talk about surgical options a little bit, and then I have my uh, um, a couple of things that the um, uh, other topics I'm going to talk about. So surgical options, I think, just us as a medicine crowd, we need to know what it is our patients are looking for, and I'm happy to go into some more detail um, on, on on some of the specifics for those who are interested. But the but I really have two points. So for the uh, masculinizing surgeries, I, I already alluded to the fact that um, the uh, that you're that at least um, um, for transgender guys who are on looking for hormones, um, almost all of them are looking for chest reconstruction surgeries, masculinizing chest reconstruction surgeries. Um, notably, and I, I, I had I said already that um, our ability to do masculinizing um, genital reconstruction surgeries like phalloplasty are um, are not as well established 
the transgender guys know this and under 10% of them are actually seeking those surgeries. And that has implications too, especially for those of us who are in primary care to recognize that a transgender man coming in to see you in, 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 in clinic is more likely than not to still have um, um, uterus ovaries uh, and, 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 and vagina and cervix um, um, importantly. Um, and so on the one hand, from a fertility perspective for some of those younger guys, I actually have the ability to extract an egg if I want to. Um, but uh, the flip side of it is these are people who are gonna need some monitoring for cervical cancer and such. Um, and then on the feminizing side, the um, relevant points are that we're very genital focused in how we talk about surgeries for transgender people as if everything is about genital rearrangement. Um, but truth is, and especially for some of our old patients who come to attention later in their lives, um, their, um, the focus can heavily be on the face. I talked way back at the beginning about the impact of androgen and that most of these people are, 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 are presenting later. And for people who are presenting significantly later, there's just more virilization. And so for them, what's in their, their genitals are, 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 are between them and their intimate others. And there may not be the urgency to do um, um, surgery there, but um, the, uh, their, their faces, how they're presenting to absolutely everybody else in society could be much more significant. And uh, that, um, and so just facial feminization surgery from a comfort and even for a safety perspective can be enormous. And when we're looking at it through a cisgender lens, we're just thinking about it as cosmetic, but for, for transgender people, it could be equally medically important to, uh, to, to genital reconstruction, if not more so, depending upon the transgender woman. Um, so I, um, I have like three little add-ons here. So my little add-ons are just our program here at Mount Sinai, the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery. Because uh, there's there there are but you can see that I touched on a bunch of surgical elements, some 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 medical elements, and it, it sounds like it could be kind of complicated. But if we're um, going to have uh, um, improved access to care, we need to be seeing these people in specialties where we have expertise, because none of this is very complicated in our own domains. And so part of the role for, uh, for the, our transgender program is to be a, um, a single address where pretty much everything can come, where everybody can be sent, who, has a, who, who is interested in a medical intervention for being trans. And then we have a, um, a, 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 a navigation team that can, um, can help get people to where they need to be across our very large system. Um, the, um, you, we just, we have a phone number you can find on the internet. You, we have a, um, you, in Epic, there is an ambulatory um, um, re referral order to, uh, um, to transgender medicine and surgery, and you don't even have to know which it, you're looking for because we'll figure it out. And we have, um, um, primary care providers or if people are on this call who want to be among, on our list of primary care providers, we can, we can add you. We, and then across Sinai, we have adolescent medicine. We, have, uh, we actually have pediatrics, mental health, endocrine, infectious disease, and then all the various surgical options. We have um, right now 11 surgeons across Sinai who are part of our program. All right. So part of the problem, though, when I'm thinking about um, um, research. That's going to be my last um, minute or so before opening it up to questions. And, and, and I've um, alluded to so, some of the research um, questions that might exist. But if we're going to start to be rigorous about it, one of our first problems is even identifying who the transgender people are. And here's one of, uh, uh, and here, here's issue number one, probably for, in terms of biggest impact, um, which is when we ask sex, we are right now only asking, we say sex, or sometimes we say gender, because we conflate those terms, like I said, way at the beginning. And our, your options are male or female, or may soon to be X, maybe depends on your state. Um, and what we need to be doing as kind of our, on our standard demographic forms, um, uh, which by the way, BioMe, BioBank was doing, and the, the, the million person um, DNA collection, I hope we'll start doing um, in the next few months, they're working on it. Um, but we probably, we need to be doing this just globally across Sinai clinically, where, which is a two-step question. And it goes like this, you ask gender identity, and then you can, these are, I, I wrote on, wrote here, are the, it's kind of the classic options, um, male, female, transgender man, transgender women, not all transgender people identify as transgender, by the way, they might just list themselves as male or female, that's fine, or some, um, some in-between um, spectrum 
label or non-binary or genderqueer. And when you have a computer, of course, you can just have a big drop down. Um, and then the second question is, what's the sex recorded on your original birth certificate, which uh, for most of us could be male or female, and now there's this X option in New York. Um, and that's the whole series. And then when there's discordance here, that is our trans population. And um, we do need to get to this. And the failure to get to this is actually one of our biggest barriers in research right now. We have search terms where we look across Sinai and identify people, but it's not nearly as clean as if we just asked it up front, same as we do, let's say race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, so um, um, research questions, if we actually identified the people um, and um, what would our questions even be? And um, so really, from a hormone perspective, in terms of concerns, the pitfalls are hypogonadism and avoiding osteoporosis and, and various um, uh, harms from superphysiologic hormone dosing, including um, erythrocytosis with androgens and that, from, that dose connected thrombosis risk with estrogens. Um, and so when we're thinking of research, something to see what's happening out there is there's a lot of focus on the potential harms of hormone therapy, but like you've heard me say a bunch of times already, I don't think that's really what we're going to see heavily. And in fact, the morbidities we associate with trans people, like increased heart disease and such, might better associate with the, um, with social disparities um, um, uh, and, um, and social determinants of health and things like that and um, something we call minority stress. And I think there's reason to expect that association and, and actually improved health as we get people into gender affirming treatment pro, um, programs because we can provide care for them. The interesting side element though is that while um, I don't think there are many harms to learn for androgen impact for our transgender people in terms of global health, one thing they do serve as is a model for understanding biology in general. Um, you, know, I'm, you know, you can hear when I talked about gender identity, I talked about gender identity for everybody. I didn't, I wasn't being trans specific. And um, we are taking people where the primary treatment that we offer them is changing their hormone profile in a fairly dramatic way, which creates a model for us actually to investigate, name your tissue, um, the, um, the uh, um, hormone action. Um, in, um, uh, uh, in a certain group of people. And I think there's great opportunity for us to learn what we're doing to trans people, obviously, but also what, what's true for all of our biology, more generally speaking. All right, so um, I left us with a couple of minutes. I don't know whether I should just poke things in the chat room or someone wants to moderate. I'm happy, to, I'm happy with either. I can moderate. Thank you so much, Dr. Safer, for that wonderful talk. Um, we have quite a few questions already in the chat, so I will start with the one sent by Dr. Kraft, asking, can you comment on the use of testosterone levels in athletes to differentiate male from female competitors? Yeah, so... Right. so, so oh, Josh, the reason I brought, I brought that up is because it seems like there's a lot of heterogeneity in testosterone levels, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly among... Um, uh, individuals that want to compete in the female category. <clears throat> so that's caused some controversy, as you know. So I know you're involved in this. And so I was wondering if you had an opinion about it. Yeah, so, so um, the data are few. Um, the, the data are in, in big cross-sectional studies that, um, that female athletes who have PCOS or have certain DSDs um, are overrepresented among some of the athletes. Um, and so there's fear that testosterone may, 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 may be relevant there. When we're actually looking at trans people specifically, um, then we've got three studies on planet Earth right now, including two from the military, where at least with regard to middle distance running, sit-ups and push-ups, after a year or so of lowering androgen levels, even for people who went through a male puberty, the advantage seems to be erased. Now, you know that when you go through, uh, you know, testosterone hits you at two points. It hits you at puberty, where it affects your pelvis, it affects height, you know, there's, so it has impact there. And it, um, and it affects you throughout life with muscle size and such. Uh, you can make arguments depending upon the sport both ways, because if you're gonna be focused exclusively on things where that height and pelvis shape are gonna be the relevant um, actors, then maybe uh, once you've gone through the puberty, you, um, the typically male puberty, uh, shifting your androgens around is not gonna be sufficient. Alternatively, um, if you've got bigger bones from that historical male puberty and now we shrink your muscles, we might've put you at a disadvantage. Um, for, for a certain competition. And, and then nobody has to have any anxiety about transgender women participating because on average they're going to do worse. Um, so um, the, all, all 
cool things to study, um, World Athletics, which is track and field, um, just um, um, made a fairly strict line. Um, I'm actually, I think, going to chair the the the, um, the expert committee on that in terms of looking at people both with BSD, intersex, and 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 trans, um, where they're going to insist on very very tight testosterone levels for the DSD intersex folks, and for the trans folks, they're going to only allow people who did not who who, who got identified at ten or two and have been on GnRH agonists followed by by hormones since. So very strict. But in terms of whether that's right or not, I think we have to do some research. Great, thank you. Our next question says, thank you for the interesting talk. Fascinating to hear about egg retrieval and surrogate pregnancy for transgender men. Could egg retrieval occur during all premenstrual ages or is there an earlier age you want to make sure this occurs beforehand? Uh, so I think this is, the, so, so that's a question that's better to target maybe to um, GYNs, but I can say this kind of simplistically as an adult endocrinologist, that we know that um, the ability to, um, um, to retrieve eggs does decline, and that I would predict should be true for the transgender guys, same as for cisgender women. Um, so I don't want to overpromise to them. I don't even know that it's equal to cisgender women. I only know that we can do it because we have done it um, in some of our patients. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Dr. Collar says, thank you for the excellent presentation. How does the Mount Sinai lab report reference values for transgender individuals or do we? We, we, yeah, so we, we don't, our, our lab is gendered, male, female, has nothing to do with being trans. Um, for most laboratory values, if you look, there really isn't a sex difference anyway. And so um, I don't know that that makes a whole heck of a lot of difference. And then for those things where there is a sex difference, often it's related to hormones, where if people's hormones are shifting, somebody trans might be somewhere in the middle. And so the doctor's going to have to just take that into consideration. I, um, I, I was just um, talking to the transplant, um, um, whatever it's called, the, consor the, the national co uh, consortium, where they, um, UNOS uh, is, is their acronym. Um, where they um, are looking to see um, where, where basically creatinine is 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 is, is, is relevant, and so um, I think what they're going to end up doing is saying if you are trans and on hormones, so that your muscle mass is shifted and your creatinine is shifted, then we're going to switch your category, uh, and 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 that would be an example of where you have to know about it. Plus sex hormones, of course. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sachs, it's great talk. Thank you. Opponents of transgender care seem to emphasize regret. What are the data for that? Our, our, our best data for regret right now, the, old, the, the, the what gets pulled up a lot is, a, is an old study from the Netherlands where they um, didn't ask the kids if what gender identity they were. They It's very a sex stereotypical questions they asked and then they kind of assume gender identity. So if you like to play with trucks, you're a boy. If you like to play with mm -hmm. dolls, you're a girl, kind of that. And so among people who like to play with trucks, um, you know, <laughs> um, X percent of them ended up being girls or boys or whatever, and so so-called not trans. But I, you know, I, you, will you already hear how I'm phrasing it and what the problem with those data are? Um, so they have, um, so they had 80 percent of kids they thought might be trans ended up not being trans. Um, but being much more conscientious, there's a a, um, a research um, group run by. Um, uh, um, uh, Dr. Olson at Princeton, um, um, conscientiously and carefully looking after kids who are presenting as gender diverse, where there's where the, where there's certainly the feeling from talking to them that they really are trans, and there about one percent or so are not being treated downstream. Um, so ninety nine percent of the time they are, and they want to continue treatment even. Thank you. And the last question, I was struck by the reference to the WHI as it involved predominantly asymptomatic women between the ages of 50 and 79. The estrogen only observation is interesting, but I found the study as a whole faulty. Was there anything else that you took out of that study? Yeah, so... Um, when in, in transgender medicine, part of our problem is we don't have a lot of studies that are specific to what we want. And so we're looking for surrogates all over the place. And uh, the, the WHI is just a big study of, um, of, of, of people 
cis women um, who at a time when there's more of a thrombosis risk in their aging, at least, but it's true, it's using conjugated equine estrogens, which are maybe a little bit more thrombogenic because they use some other estrogens besides pure estradiol, which maybe is a little less um, thrombogenic, which is what we're using for trans people. Um, you know, is it that relevant to a younger person who's at less risk? Um, you know, I, 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 all, all of that is taken. We also use birth control data where we use ethan, where ethanyl estradiol is the estrogen used, which is a very thrombogenic estrogen, um, and, um, and 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 that has certain implications. And are we over over using those data from usually younger uh, cis women? Um, so, so point is taken. But part of what I want to say is that. Um, um, this is a little bit of a probe into our discussion of sex steroids in general. So um, the fact that we're so nervous about putting um, postmenopausal women on estrogens um, has its, um, I, 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 I guess I'm quarreling a little bit with that. Um, and our fear of estrogens is, um, is, uh, is, is maybe o overdone across the board. And I'm learning it because I'm focusing on trans people, but it might be relevant to, 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 to cis women too. Um, I don't think, and I, I'm gonna say a controversial thing, but, um, uh, but I don't think if we were like blocking testosterone from, from men that um, most men would be okay with that. And you know, just just putting out there, that's a conversation for another time. How you know what? How we in the medical establishment, you know, have our own little biases and how we treat people. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Safer, for the wonderful talk. It looks like that is all of the questions, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time since we are now at um, nine thirty-seven. Um, thank you again, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks a lot.